It's no secret that Idaho has a housing crisis. Housing is hard to come by and units that are available are expensive. There's no single solution to the complex problem, but one piece is the Workforce Housing Fund created by the 2022 legislature. This week, associate producer Logan Finney travels to Bonner County to see how the fund is working out in their community. I don't think that it's a secret. There's a need throughout the state for all types of housing. One way to address a lack of affordable housing, build more homes at more prices that Idahoans can afford. Financing that right price point is often easier said than done, says marketing director Jason Lands from the Idaho Housing and Finance Association. Affordable housing is kind of a broad term. The challenges that a resort community like in the Ketchum area would face is completely different from what, you know, more metropolitan area like Boise or the Treasure Valley would face. And then you throw in, you know, there's an acute need for affordable housing that's safe for, you know, in rural areas. We are rural. Every inch of Bonner County is considered rural by the USDA standards. Crystal Horvath is executive director of the Bonner Community Housing Agency, a Sandpoint nonprofit that, unlike a governmental housing authority, partners with developers and residents to help build private homes in an achievable price range. What we strive to do is build homes that people making the average median income can afford to purchase. For a family of four, the state says median income is about fifty-seven to sixty thousand dollars a year uh, to adults. I know lots of people that have one or two part-time jobs, and they are making you know, 2000 a month and feel pretty blessed to be making that. Low income housing is one piece of affordability, but recent policy efforts have narrowed to focus on workforce housing, or homes in the price range of people who, in theory, are making a decent salary, but still struggle finding a place to live. The intent there is housing for people who are increasingly finding it difficult to find affordable housing that are in the workforce already. And, you know, that could be anywhere from nurses to teachers to first responders. We need people to come here that are our doctors and nurses and law enforcement and you know all these public servants. We are we are missing the mark with that price range and lower. Nancy Hadley is a longtime Bonner County resident with deep family ties in the community. She owns a piece of land in town which she's developing in partnership with the Bonner Community Housing Agency. BCHA um, helped me develop it and come up with the idea of smaller lots, uh, the triplex, uh, the quad buildings, duplexes, and keeping them single family so they're single family attached. As an example, 10 years ago, 250000 was the price that I wanted to hit. And by the time you do all the infrastructure, cost of the land, build the houses, and builders are very hard to come by, I just wasn't able to hit the target number. Unfortunately now, you know, our number is 360 to 450. And then with the change in interest rates, that also has changed it. Basically stalled the project because all the prices increased and the cost of all the supplies increased, the cost of building increased, and then nobody can afford those loans. Most of our local employees are not making $30 an hour. They're making, if they're lucky, $16 an hour and a lot of them are at 10 to $12 an hour. Hopefully interest rates will come back around and we'll be able to work with some other programs that hopefully we'll be able to get some people in there and they'll be able to have home ownership. State lawmakers in 2022 used $50 million from the American Rescue Plan Act to create the Workforce Housing Fund, a program that supplies gap financing in support of housing developments targeted at Idaho's workforce. Gap financing is a, is a very important piece to a complicated financial puzzle that's necessary to build these types of homes. There's a complicated stack of funding. You know, there's private investment, there's workforce housing fund, there's community investment. All those funding mechanisms stack up and the workforce housing fund steps in again to fill that gap between what the affordable rents can support, and then the cost of building and operating a development for the long term. Gap financing from the Workforce Housing Fund allowed Bonner Community Housing Agency to construct two triplex buildings on Hadley's property, making for six workforce units. The fund financed another development in Sandpoint with 91 units and 15 more developments for a total of 1,156 workforce housing units all across the state. 
It was a true collaborative effort between municipalities, developers, other lenders, and us. Those 1,150 units are spread across rural, urban, top to bottom, you know, 17 developments in 11 different communities. The numbers just didn't work any other way. So by having the state participate, and especially since it was my goal to build affordable housing for workforce, it was just heaven sent. The only reason that's even moving forward right now is because of the ARPA workforce housing funds. Otherwise, there would be no funds to build even one unit as a spec home to try and use to sell the rest of the units. Even with the support of the Workforce Housing Fund and other financing programs available, housing advocates still see a deep need for affordability. I have approximately 300 families on my list looking for housing, and we get calls almost every day and walk-ins multiple times a week. I can't tell you how many single moms I have with kids that are working, you know, 30, 40 hours a week, and they just can't save enough money to afford the deposit and the security and first and last and everything that it costs to get into a place, even if they can find a place. Some private employers, like Schweitzer Mountain Resort, have turned to building their own employee housing to help get at the issue. But that's not a realistic solution for every local employer. We've had other businesses who have told us that they have had people accept job positions and then have to turn them down because they can't find a house to live in. They can't move up here and accept the job. We need those people. We need working class people. We need the trades here. And, you know, so we're looking at jobs in the 60, 70, $80,000 range. And there's no way that I'm going to be able to provide housing in the 30 to 40,000. But, you know, a two income earning family, um, something like that sold a lot to a school teacher. I'm working with that person to get them a USDA loan to actually be able to build, because they can't even build on the lot yet. With assistance from organizations like the Idaho Housing and Finance Association and the Bonner Community Housing Agency, Idahoans are getting closer to affordable home ownership, but there's still a long way to go. Whether it's financing or people who would help or families who would donate land at a reduced price to the housing agency or Local families who, instead of renting their house on Airbnb, were willing to rent it to a pre-qualified local family, because that's one of the things we run into as well, as so many homes are going up on vacation rental sites that, again, people are being kicked out of their homes because they can make three grand renting out their house instead of 1,500 a month renting it out to a consistent person. You know, if we can do 30, 40, the 20%. I mean, it's just a few units along the way. If everybody did that, it would make a huge difference. There's going to be multiple answers and multiple avenues, groups of people, hopefully, that come together to create some stability in the low-income housing need. And joining me to discuss that fund is Logan Finney. Logan, thanks so much for your work on this. If an Idahoan is curious about this fund, how can they take advantage of it? Um, sure, the workforce development, excuse me, the workforce housing fund is uh, open just like any other sort of loan program or grant program to developers who are looking to build these type of units. What are the status of those units that you discussed with some of your sources in this package? Sure, um, I actually just spoke with Crystal Horvath from the uh, Bonner Community Housing Agency yesterday. She said that uh, they've poured foundations that concrete is curing and they are optimistic and hopeful that construction will wrap up in the spring and they'll be able to get some people housed fairly soon. So as we're talking about these more than 1,000 units that this fund has made possible, these are still largely units that are in progress. They're not available for people to move in right now. Oh, certainly, yes. And when I, when I spoke with the Idaho Housing and Finance Association, they're the ones that administer this grant through the authority given to them by the state. Um, the, the loans are closed and everything is financed, but it, it is still very early in that construction phase. That's part of the, the reason housing is, you know, the, part of the reason this issue is so complicated is it takes a long time between idea to concept to execution to actually getting someone in the house. It's, it's just a long time frame. We talk a lot about funding and interest rates, but there are some policy issues at play here too. I think I've heard a lot of people talk about things like tiny homes as a potential solution to affordable housing, but that's not gonna do you any good if you have nowhere to put the tiny home, which is a zoning issue. What are some other uh, issues that are not specifically tied to funding that you ran into? 
Sure, uh, similar to zoning, which is not an issue that the state has any say in, that's more of a county and city local issue. Um, a similar financial factor is the cost of um, the applications, the design reviews that cities and planning and zoning commissions do, the cost to hook up to power and water city infrastructure, depending on the city, that can also um, be a, a hindrance if a lot of those very small fees stack up or they can be different from city to city and so that's just one more piece that a that a more local policymaker could could make an impact on you touch on this briefly in the package but airbnbs and short-term vacation rentals are also part of this because uh, homeowners are choosing to rent out on a short-term basis to get more money as opposed to a long-term basis local municipalities can't ban Airbnbs or local vacation rentals in Idaho. Right, that's right. That is a, uh, a policy area that the state legislature has has passed a preemption law saying that uh, it's the, the state law takes precedent over over what's any sort of regulations that a local city would, would implement. All right, thanks so much for your work on this, Logan.